Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, will David Trone's slip of the lip derail his campaign for U.S. Senate? Is it time to fire the school board, as only 40% of MCPS graduates are proficient in math and just 62 for English? County Council addresses the Child Investment Fund and the development of religious properties for housing. And finally, the Francis Scott Key Bridge tragedy. How well has government responded? Our panel of experts will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by Lori Halverson, a member of the Montgomery County Republican Central Committee and former House of Delegate member and attorney, Marise Morales. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. The Democratic Party primary race for the U.S. Senate seat being vacated by Senator Ben Cardin has taken an interesting turn lately. Early on, it was widely presumed that millionaire David Trone would self-fund his campaign to victory against his less well-funded opponents. But then while caught in the heat of debate about Republicans, he had a slip of the lip and uttered a racial slur. Game changer? Well, maybe. Marise, does Trone's use of a racial slur expose his deep-seated racial animosity towards Blacks? And should that be a disqualification from him running? Yeah, I, I am not one to qualify an animosity towards any human being or group of human beings. However, what it does say um, is, is his lack of sensitivity, especially given the population that he represents. Um, I think his campaign did a phenomenal job at addressing it in terms of um, you know, how he's been quoted in the media. It's clear that he has somebody on his PR team that has, you know, um, knowledge about how this made the black community feel. You can you can tell in, in the way that he expresses himself and his apology. I think he addressed it really well. Um, I do think it, it is damaging, however, especially because, you know, he is running against a black woman. Um, and you have one third of a democratic vote represented by the black um you know, community. Um, and I think at, at this point in 2024, um, you know, you, you have to really understand the, I guess, the fabric of the communities that you're, that you're representing. I think, you know, when it comes to racism or, or racial um, bias, it is very subconscious. So when it comes out in moments where you're not filtered, et cetera, it actually does show uh, your, who you are truly. And does that, do you think that accounts for the number of endorsements that Angela also Brooks received immediately thereafter from, uh, you know, well-known uh, African-American politicians? I think um, it shows that the Democratic establishment, if they were a little bit on, you know, on edge or they were about to maybe endorse uh, Angela, but weren't sure, this at least definitely gave them that final push. She does have the support of the most uh, most of the congressional delegation, which, which I think um, says a lot. So, uh, Lori, you know, uh, it's still you know, Mr. Trone is still leading in the polls, and according to some insiders, is still likely to win. Is this a feature that can be exploited in the general general election uh, by whomever the Republican candidate is? I don't really see the Republican candidate really focusing on that one thing. Um, however, I think that uh, Trone made a mistake when he said he was a white man of privilege. That was definitely a trigger for me as a um, as a white person that I just don't. What does that have to do with saying the racial slur? I really don't think that that was necessary. Um, and he also a, a lot of people didn't know that term. And had to look it up. Um, I the, I read an article, didn't even see the term in the article, and had to look it up. And um, so he's added another term to a lot of young people's vocabulary. It was obviously in his vocabulary. And um, you know, imagine imagine what would have happened if if Trump said that word in the same context. We well, wouldn't we have to Jamie imagine Raskin what, what Trump would say. We saw that with with the George Allen race in yeah. Virginia. 
He, I mean, we're, he, we're Amy Raskin would be screaming through the rooftops and having a field day <laughs> with this, saying that, um, you know, that Trump is racist and they would be showing the clip over and over and over again without any context. But we've been able to see the context and understand the context with how the reporters have talked about drones the way he said it. And so they reported it and he responded um, you know, trying, you know, admitting the mistake and apologize. Now, Republicans would apologize as well for doing that, and we wouldn't have gotten the same treatment. So we need to have better reporting on when mistakes are made like this. Well, I mean, you know, as you both know, uh, negative ads do are, are effective, and I'm sure yeah. uh, uh, as we get to the general, you know, as we get closer to the general election, maybe as we get closer to the primary election in June, we'll see some ads uh, uh, negatively uh, addressing the issue. Uh, I, I think I've always thought that Angela Alsobrooks was a better candidate than uh, Mr. Trone. Um, she's a very savvy lady. She run, I think she's done a great job in Prince George's County as county executive. And um, it's, you know, I think the race is gonna tighten um, and I'll just, I'm, since we have about 30 seconds left, I'm going to ask each of you, who do you think is going to win the primary between David Trone and Angela also Brooks? And I'll start with Mara say, I, you know, I really don't know. I think it is going to tighten. I, I, you know, I, I, I know both of them personally, um, uh, David Trone and I served similar communities. Um, I didn't see, you know, a genuine, um, I would say. We're running out of time, Mara say yes or no. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. But I think a Angela has a good shot. <laughs> OK, Lori, you got from what I've seconds. viewed lately. I'd say also Brooks, uh, you know, I think also <laughs> Brooks seems like the better candidate. Well, it's going to be great. It's going to be a horse race when we come down to June. It'll be interesting <laughs> to see the primary results, both in the Republican and the Democratic primaries. All right. We've got to shift gears. We've got to look at uh, MCPS, our our favorite uh, topic every week. Uh, earlier this year, there were worrisome reports that you know, should the negative effects on MCPS students falling behind in grade levels in math and in English for that was for 10th graders and for students in the in the middle school. But this week, the County Council's Education and Cultural Committee reviewed the college and career measurements of MCPS graduates. And they came came out with some shocking results. Only 40 percent of MCPS graduates are proficient in math and just 62 percent in English. Mara say, you know, you are on the board of Montgomery College, and I understand this is a very important topic for you. How do we address this when we're sending out graduates who really can't function in the workforce or in college? I honestly, I'm so, I'm so glad you brought this, this topic this week, Casey. Um, that is true. We, we, at Montgomery College, we're having to remediate most of the admitted students to Montgomery College. You know, I think this is an issue where there's an imbalance of how uh, teachers are being held, held accountable. Um, as I, I sp I've spoken before, you know, the, the teachers union has a lot of power and control as to who gets on the board of education. And ultimately those, ca those candidates that then become elected, they tend to listen to the cohort of people that got them there. So I think, you know, um, as taxpayers, in Montgomery County, we're, we're spending 13,000 per pupil on top of 7,000 that we're getting from the state. Um, and, you know, in return, we're getting, um, you know, uh, graduates that are not college ready. Um, I think there's definitely needs to be a shift in, in the power um, in terms of, you know, who is, who is the superintendent uh, really representing, who is the board of education really representing, and who's representing the students themselves. Um, I think this is a, an issue that the county has been struggling with for years, and I'm hoping that, you know, expert, um, subject matter experts can really address, um, you know, the, basically the, how we're failing our, our, our student body. You know, Lori, uh, there's, I think, you know, one of the things that came out of COVID was a greater awareness by parents th as to what was going on in the schools. And they're disappointed by the fact that their you know, kids aren't getting a, a good education. And, you know, Adam Pugnuko uh, is a, you know, fabulous uh, online uh, advocate for Montgomery County. 
And he points out that Montgomery, that MCPS is one of the better funded school systems with 90% of the students graduating. But unfortunately, there seems to be a, the significant number of MCPS that are not ready when they graduate. So how do we fix this? How do we turn this around? Well, for one thing, transparency, like even Adam Pugnuco couldn't get a lot of details uh, when he reported on this. And so I did a little deeper dive trying to find um, the report. And I even tried to look at the Education Committee uh, video and I didn't find the, uh, rep the uh, presentation of this report. So I, I'm very confused, but I do know that they're basing uh, college and career readiness on basically getting an A, B, or C in Algebra 1 or uh, being able to pass a test that is very low level um, Algebra 1. I mean, is just completing Algebra 1 uh, make you college and career ready? I mean, you're, you're supposed to have more than that to get to college. Um, I, I don't know why they have such a low bar now. They are, well, I do know why they're trying to make it more likely for everyone to qualify to get into college, but that's not helping people once they get to college. So I, you know, I'm very concerned with the benchmarks that they have and, um, you know, what is happening with our board of ed, you really should pay attention to who you vote for. I would not vote for any incumbents and I would not vote for any teacher, um, uh, recommendations, uh, the teachers union recommendations. Um, That's right. Throw the bums that, out. And it's yeah, throw the bums out. out. You need someone That's who will actually cry. ask for, for data that, that the public at least can see. Cause I couldn't yeah. find it. Well, it's, it's, you know, um, it's, it's so overlooked. The school board elections are so important and they don't get enough attention in the media or even, even, even though we talk about it almost every week how important it is. Anyway, when we come back from this short break, what is the county council working on and how well has government responded to the Francis Scott Key Bridge tragedy? Stay tuned. When I first saw a turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. 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 And welcome back. Once again, the Montgomery County Council has been very active. And I want to take a look at two items in particular, that being the Child Investment Fund proposed by council members uh, Will Jawando and Gabe Albernalis, and the Zoning Text Amendment to allow affordable housing to be constructed uh, adjacent to places of worship. Two very interesting uh, proposals. Marcy, I I'm not sure exactly how the Child Investment Fund is supposed to work. As I read it, you know, it's, it's going to draw funds from the general fund um, and that will be segregated for the what they call the CIF for all children born to parents living in Montgomery County after uh, this past January, January 20, January 1 of 24. And when the child reaches 18, they then may apply for disbursements to be used for school or to start a business. It's kind of a broad, broad brush description. But more importantly, the eligibility standards are also kind of broad and ill-defined, um, but it does appear it's going to be means tested. So what, is that is that the best way to handle this? First of all, I think this is uh, a genius um, measure. I think, um, you know, when it comes to who contributes to the revenue to uh, for Montgomery County in general, all taxpayers, um, and individuals who may be undocumented with a tax ID and get no return for their contributions. So this is a genius way to re redistribute the wealth. Um, and like you very well mentioned, it would be based on the means and income when that uh, child reaches an age of majority to have access to those funds. And so it is very bare bones. Um, it's my understanding that it just was introduced there will be hearings this summer, uh, but it has not, you know, it, it's very, very bare, bare bones. And I think that when it comes to the eligibility for, um, you know, what you want to use the funds for, you know, it makes sense that it is to, to basically reinvest those dollars into Montgomery County. So you, if you could start a business, you could invest in a business, 
it's to be able to buy a home. Um, and it's also uh, for, so, so you're able to invest in retirement. So when it comes to, um, you know, individuals who are born into wealthy families and they're savvy enough to, you know, put their money, money away before it's taxed, for example, um, then, you know, it's almost, it's just a redistribution of, 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 of funds. So I think, um, this is very bare bones. There's definitely going to be more to be looked at. It's my understanding that it, uh, there's a composition of 13 uh, members of an advisory board who's going to really look into the, the nuts and bolts of what this program would ultimately look like. You know, uh, Lori, last week uh, on the last, the last show we did, we didn't have a show this last week because of Easter, Easter break. We talked about the vanishing middle class in Montgomery County, how statistically uh, we are our low income class class of, of, of residents are increasing. Our wealthy class of residents uh, is increasing, but the middle class is seeming to disappear. You know what ha what happens to the forgotten middle class? Shouldn't their children be eligible as well? Nobody should be eligible. This is the government is not a giveaway machine. Um, and I think Marse actually made me realize this is, this is a this is gonna this is for the undocumented. That's what this bill is for, and our money is going to be going toward people who cross the border without, uh, you know, legal without doing it legally. And and why should we you have pay to be born in the United their... States to receive those funds, Lori? You have to be born in the United States, correct? And in Montgomery right. County. So <laughs> well, then uh, okay. So yeah, but their parents are probably undocumented, right? So that's the point. It's what I'm trying to make. And um, and I want to ask, what is this effort trying to accomplish? Is it going to help families? Uh, you have to wait till you're at least 18 to collect the money that, that the government put aside for you. Um, how does that help families raise their children? Um, it provides a little extra income later, but it doesn't help them raise their children in the very important time when they have to be doing well in school and be fed and have their supplies for school. Um, does it help kids to be ready for college or career? No. Should our money be going towards that when it does nothing to help our kids be ready for college and career? No, this is not accomplishing anything, but it's just a big giant government giveaway I don't think this is the um, a genius idea at all, uh, and it and it goes eighteen hundred goes into for each child, and then not every child it doesn't come out that way. It sounds like only the low income kids would get the money. So how's that fair to all the other kids? I mean, yes, middle class well, and upper have, class should be eligible for it if there is one. But I say say no, we should not be doing this at all. It's, we're going to have to leave the debate there because you know we have another another piece of legislation that's also been introduced that I want to talk about. And, Mar and Marcy, I'm quite intrigued by the zoning text amendment introduced by Council and uh, Council President Andrew Friedson and Council Vice President Kate Stewart to allow housing to be developed adjacent to places of worship, because on the surface, it would expand the amount of land available for housing. I think this is another really uh, amazing and creative way to um, build uh, so that we have more, you know, housing available for folks that can't otherwise afford it. And uh, frankly, you know, when it comes to specific um, areas of the, 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 the zoning code that are going to be affected, what it tells me is that leaders within the faith community and or the educational institutions that have land actually came to the county council with this idea. So, um, you know, I think this is also going to, you know, bring up or maybe in incentivize other sectors to do the same. And that way, land that has otherwise been kind of just out there and being wasted can actually now serve, um, you know, our, our housing crisis that we have in Montgomery County. You know, Lori, I think this is a really intriguing uh, proposal. I think how it's going to be administered is is going to be, you know, very, very interesting as well, because if I was a pastor of a church and I wanted to develop land for additional housing, I would like the congregation to have, be able to have access for it. Or if I ran a school along with the church, I'd like to be able to have workforce housing for my teachers. So, uh, what you know, are we forgetting that, you know, that there are other uses besides just affordable housing here? You know, I think it's really sad that the American dream is now, the Democrats version of the American dream is workforce housing. I mean, workforce housing, when we used to have houses with yards, 
I mean, what, what we're now working towards workforce housing. What, what does that say on where our communities are going? Um, I, you know, I, I just, I feel like uh, millennials are paying attention. They don't, they don't like the fact that they had to pay for their own college and have loans that they're, that they've paid back already. And other, other young people are going to have Biden cover it for them. That's their money. They know that they're smart. They, they went to college. They know this. Um, and they, they know that, uh, their, their gas powered cars that they love are going to be taken away from them because Biden is trying to push electric vehicles. Millennials are watching and, um, you know, they don't, they don't want the workforce housing. They want a house. They want their child to be raised in a safe community, and um, and Democrats aren't aren't doing it when they say let's have more workforce housing. Well, but we we have a we we do have a land crunch here, and we we have to realize we have to maximize the use of our available land, and that's why I think it's it's an intriguing uh, proposal that has been introduced. But I as I said, uh, I think how this is going to be administered is going to be. Uh, subject of debate uh, as we go forward. We're gonna. I want to talk now about uh, the uh, tragedy that occurred in, in Baltimore. I mean, I, everyone was devastated by uh, by seeing the video of the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge over the Patapsco River. You know, I watched repeatedly, hoping that all those flickering lights that I saw on the bridge would somehow make it across before uh, the ship struck. I mean, it was just so painful to watch. But let's talk about how government has responded. Lori, I'm going to give you the first word mm -hmm. on this. How has government responded to this tragedy? Well, uh, we've seen uh, the legislator, the legislative session may be extended because of um, the interruption this caused, uh, which is perfectly understandable. Uh, they have uh, the Port Act, which they're working on passing, which would support workers that were not covered by unemployment insurance. Um, not sure what I think about that. Um, and it helps uh, businesses to fully retain uh, their workers during this time until they get the port running again and uh, incentivizes um, uh, companies to return to the same port instead of going to another port. Uh, but, you know, Andy Harris is proposing some things which I think we need to, you know, he's the only Republican and in, in, uh, representative in Maryland. And um, it, we need to listen to what he's saying because I think he's got some important things that we need to we 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 need to try to recoup money from whatever sources we can before we uh, think about taking money out of our pockets as taxpayers. Um, and I think we should focus on the hundred million dollars to clear the um, the port. That's the thing we need to focus first. And I think they need to get money to make the hundred million dollars approximately that would be needed to cover that. Uh, but, you know, I think really we, we shouldn't be jumping to say, oh, let's just we'll pay for the whole thing. You know, well, like but, but don't you think don't you think government has responded appropriately in, in trying to, to help those affected by the by the by the tragedy? Well, of course I do. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, we're a blue state. And I don't think this would have been happening so quickly if we were a red state. Uh, well, that's, yeah. that, you know, let, let's let's <laughs> leave the politics aside on uh, for yeah. <laughs> On this, on this one, Mara say it's rather impressive that already they're able to start clearing channels for uh, shallow boats, boats with a shallow drift uh, to enter the port. They've opened up two lanes. Uh, so is this a signal that uh, government is responding in an appropriate manner? Absolutely. Absolutely, Casey. I couldn't be more proud of our governor, um, the mayor of Baltimore. Um, and and I, and I actually agree with 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 Lori in terms of it's not you know it's not a coincidence that when you're in the same party and unfortunately that's you know why our politics is, are broken in the United States um, you know the the ability to work with the White House so quickly so swiftly with uh, you know Secretary of Transportation uh, Buttigieg and you know and all the different bodies of government that are being involved the the U.S. Well, Coast Guard I think you're, for, you're forgetting the Corps of Engineers. <laughs> They're doing a hell of a job. I was uh, getting it. I was getting yeah, they're they doing a hell of a, a job. They, they're they're doing, doing a lot of work. work. I was and, getting there. I was getting there. I was okay. getting the Coast Guard, the U.S. <laughs> the, the U.S. Corps of Engineers, the Maryland uh, Department of Environment, the Maryland Transportation Authority. I mean, it's it's been a, a phenomenal um, synergy in terms of getting all of those different bodies to work together collaboratively, and not you know, and not just egos and saying you know, and people tuning their own horn. Um, I think the the human the human loss of it 
Uh, we, you know, I don't see, I don't see a lot of people talking in the mainstream um, media about the immigrant workers, the six uh, families that are going to be affected. Um, and I, and I think that uh, Mayor, um, Mayor Brandon Scott responded, you know, I think appropriately. I mean, you know, it's a $300,000 fund that will benefit those families uh, from these law from this loss, but then also addressing the issues um, that are going to be faced by the 15,000 idle workers since the port's been closed. So I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a proud Marylander and I, and I couldn't be more proud of our elected officials for making those, you know, those, um, those efforts happen. I mean, while they have been able to recover some of the uh, bodies, uh, there are still four missing uh, workers that were not, have not been recovered. And we shouldn't forget mm -hmm that their loss and the fact that uh, they're uh, involved in all of this. Good discussion. I want to thank you both. Uh, when we come back, uh, from, we will have our parting shots. Stay tuned. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back. Now with Parting Shots, Lori Halverson. Yes, a few dates for you to know. Uh, May 7th is the last day to request a mail-in ballot. May 14th, ballots will be mailed to you if you've ordered one. And May 2nd is starts early voting, May 2nd through May 9th, and May 14th starts uh, is the primary. Thank Great. you, Lori. That was <laughs> very pithy. Mara <laughs> St. Morales, your party shot. Great uh, minds think alike, actually. I was going to be addressing oh. the same issue. I, oh, would okay. add, I would just add the date of, um, you have up, up until April 23rd to register to vote so that you can participate in, in the primaries coming up on May 14th. <laughs> 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 thank, thank you, Marce. And thank you both for appearing and thank you to the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show for 21 this week. I'm Casey Aiken.